I'm very, very pleased to open today's morning discussion, uh, policy discussion, a coffee with Senator Carson of Maryland. We are honored to have him early this morning, and we look forward to hearing on updates regarding American Family Plan and American Jobs Plan. Before I begin, I would like to share a little bit about National ACE. Our organization is working hard to help our AAPI business to work towards recovery. We have been providing resources and services to over 2.2 million AAPI small business across the country. So our AAPI business is open and running safely. But all work is just beginning. The impact of COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on the AAPI small business community. National ACE, along with US Black Chamber and US Hispanic Chamber, commissioned the largest national survey with a focus on Black, Hispanic, and AAPI business. For our own survey, we found that one in three female AAPI business owners experienced direct racial bias and discrimination. And 84% reported that COVID-19 has had a negative impact on their business. Additionally, near 3,800 anti-AAPI incidents were reported over the course of a year during the pandemic. Almost 40% happened at the place of business. This number are increasing too quickly and we must find a way to our AAP, for our AAPI business community to operate safely and strategically. This is why we come together with lawmakers and leaders like a Senator Ben Cardin, who believes in the fight against anti-AAPI sentiment and believe in rebuilding small business to stay resilient, stay open and running safely. In the past year, National AIDS has been fortunate to help over 13,000 small business directly and stay in touch with over 60,000 small business owners through regular virtual training and webinar technical assistance to help them stay open during the pandemic. Our organization plan is to continue this important work through our newly created AAPI Strong Program with focus on helping train business to respond and report in crisis situation, con conduct national surveys to measure hate discrimination and bias on all minority business, and host a regular roundtable discussion with policymakers, lawmakers, corporate leaders, and small business leaders to discuss ways to create impactful solutions. We invite all AAPI small business that need assistance <coughs> to reach out to our organization at the ACE small business.org or national uh, ACE.org. And thank you so much, Senator. Thank you so much for spending time with us, especially uh, during this AAPI Heritage Month. And we can celebrate together you know, for this coffee uh, time. Uh, now I would like to introduce Eugenia Henry, a Maryland small business owner. As a matter of fact, we have many, many small business owners from Maryland with us, and also some of the national business leaders throughout the country, including Jimmy Ferguson, and also uh, others, uh, uh, small business owners. Oh, yeah. We to have them on the morning uh, policy discussion, and uh, we will have a question answer discussion and uh, uh, the small business owner are going to share a few words about how their business is holding together during this challenging time and how the community is helping them uh, get through it. Now, uh, Eugenia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chilin. Good morning. My name is Eugenia Henry, the founder and the president of H2O Clinical LLC, doing business as from our clinical research. My company conduct, conducts clinical trials for pharmaceuticals and the biotech companies. And now it is my great honor to introduce Senator Ben Cardin, who is a third generation Marylander. Senator Cardin 
has been a national leader on health care, retirement security, the environment, and the physical issues while representing the people of Maryland in the, U in the US Senate. And before that, in the House of Representatives, Senator Cardin currently serves as chair of the Small Business and the Entrepreneurship Committee, which is on the forefront of rebuilding our economy. <laughs> he is a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations, Finance, and the Environment and Public Works Committees. Senator Cardin helped to write the Paycheck Protection Program that has helped the small businesses in Maryland and nationwide. Whether the economic repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic, and he created the EIDL Advance Grant Program to quickly get cash to small business, businesses in need. Senator Cardin was responsible for the extension of increased guarantees and reduced the fees in the Small Business Administration's two largest loan programs. He has made it a priority to find the better ways to provide access to credit for qualified small businesses and entrepreneurs, particularly minority-owned, women-owned, and the veteran on the businesses. He constantly is urging federal agencies to take all steps possible to meet or exceed their modest small business contracting goals. Let's welcome Senator Cardin. Well, Eugenia Henry, first of all, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and thank you for what you do to help our economy. Uh, what you're doing and helping uh, drug manufacturers get drugs to the market is critically important to our healthcare system. So thank you for finding an innovative way to move our economy forward. And that's what small businesses do. They not only create jobs, you know, more private sector jobs are created through small business, but they also find a better way to do business. They're much more innovative. And uh, certainly, Eugenia, your company has done that. And thank you so much for that great introduction. Chen Tong, thank you for your work, National Ace. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, your leadership on behalf of the uh, business community and bringing us all together. I also want to acknowledge Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and just recognize that our country's strength is in its diversity. The Asian Pacific American community has helped build this great country and have added so much to the strength of America. So we celebrate that, we celebrate your contributions and we reflect on where we need to advance uh, to make America continue to be the leader uh, democratic country in the world. And in that regard, I, I do wanna acknowledge a, a troubling rise of intolerance and hate uh, in not only America, but around the world. I am the special representative of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Parliamentary Assembly for anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance. I've held that position now for about five or six years. And I, before COVID-19, we saw a rise of this nationalist sentiment that led to uh, intolerance, hate, and violence. And we saw that in different communities at different times. Yes, we've seen it in the African-American community. We've seen it in the Muslim community. We've seen it in the LGBTQ community. We've seen it in the Jewish community. We've seen it now in the Asian-American community. And one th lessons that we've learned is that we all need to be united against any form of hate. We cannot tolerate any hate in America. And I was pleased to see that the United States Senate uh, uh, passed uh, the important legislation, S-937, uh, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. It was enacted into law and it protects uh, by the Department of Justice having a focal point to deal with the rise of hate against the Asian American community. And it starts with leadership. Words have consequences. And when the president of the United States, the former president of the United States uses the term China virus, 
It leads and gives oxygen to those who promote hate and violence. That should have no place in America. And we all need to be united in that regard. President Biden's motto is to build back better. And that means to deal with the systemic challenges we have in America. And, and I wanna thank my staff uh, outreach director, Reverend Jerome Stevens for bringing us together, but also being the bridge for all communities to be included in building back better so that we can have a stronger America. As part of building back better, uh, we've uh, passed the American Rescue Plan. We're now considering the American Jobs Plan and shortly we'll be considering the American Family Plan. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, but I wanna start with what we've done in regards to small businesses. Small businesses are the growth engine of our economy. We recognize that. When I was elected to the Senate in 2007, I asked to serve on the Small Business Committee because I recognized that. I was also following in the footsteps of Parron J. Mitchell, a congressman from Baltimore, who chaired the Small Business Committee in the House of Representatives and recognized that we need to fine tune the tools to help minority communities. So I'm following in his footsteps now as the chair of the Senate Small Business Committee. So during the initial uh, time during COVID-19 where we had a chance to develop new tools to help small businesses, I was then ranking Democrat on the committee. Uh, we passed the CARES Act and established uh, uh, new programs to help small businesses, including the Paycheck Protection Program, the most po popular program of all. Over 10 million small businesses have received these forgivable loans to the tune of $784 billion of help to small businesses. It's been a lifeline. Without this, th th that program, many small businesses would not be in existence today. <clears throat> Our economy would not have the type of optimistic future that we have today if we didn't have our small business uh, infrastructure in place as, and say th through the Paycheck Protection Program, through the Idle Advance Program, through the Idle Loan Program, all these were enhanced uh, during COVID-19 with the most recent changes occurring in the American Rescue Plan under President Biden's leadership. As we started the program, we learned lessons from this program. In fact, uh, I recognized as we were developing the Paycheck Protection Program that there would be challenges in underserved, underbanked minority communities. And that's why I put into that legislation a requirement that the Small Business Administration make <coughs> outreach to minority communities and underbanked communities to make sure they were treated fairly. And the Inspector General indicated that under the Trump administration, they didn't do that. They did not carry out the intent of Congress to help underserved communities. So as we replenish funds in the small business programs, as we added new tools available, we took more directive action to help minority communities, including providing direct support for mission lenders who are more likely to give capital to underserved communities. We put money into the CDFIs, the Community Development Finance in Institutions. We put money into MDIs, Minority Depository Institutions. And we walled off funds to go to the most vulnerable of the small businesses. Now, why is this important? Because look, in the Asian American, Asian Pacific American community, we know that almost three out of every four small business owners have suffered revenue losses as a result of COVID-19. We know that 50% have had revenue losses in excess of 25%. Now, small businesses are the growth engine, but they don't have the resiliency. And particularly in minority communities, they don't have access to deep pockets and capital. So we have to provide the targeted relief to the uh, small businesses who need it, uh, particularly in the minority communities. So we focus the programs in order to help uh, those uh, most in need. Uh, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, there's now two new programs. One just opened uh, about a week ago. Another one will be opening now. Uh, that is the shuttered venue program and the restaurant program. We did that because these businesses were ordered by government not to operate at full capacity or in, in some cases couldn't operate at all. So we now have those programs that are open, but we also targeted early relief 
to the smaller uh, and the, those that are more likely to be owned by minority business owners uh, in the restaurant field and in the shuttered venue field. So we are targeting the funds. And in fact, we're doing much better. The most recent information coming out from the Small Business Administration shows that we are reaching the smaller of the small businesses and those in underserved communities. But we're not stopping there. There are tools that existed before COVID-19 that we're not doing as well in all communities, uh, in the underserved communities. So we wanna fine tune these programs and we also want to adopt new programs. So that's why I've introduced legislation, one on the emerging, set up an office of emerging markets within the SBA office of capital. So that when we get venture capital opportunities, which are so difficult for minority businesses to find venture capital partners, the Small Business Administration will help connect those dots under legislation that I filed. I've also introduced legislation known as the Uplift Bill, which would partner the SBA uh, with HBCUs and minority depository and minority institutions in order to develop incubators and accelerator programs to help minority small businesses. I've also introduced the uh, Resiliency Act, the Minority Business Resiliency Act, which would codify the MBDAs, Minority Business Development Agency, make it part of law rather than just executive order and expand the opportunities under the, these programs to connect the dots. We're also implementing a program that President Biden initiated, the, uh, the uh, program that allows us uh, to, uh, to have uh, representatives in our community that can work with small businesses in an effort to, to connect them to the programs that are available uh, that we think will, will help with community navigators. So all these are new programs. We're looking at strengthening existing programs. The 7A uh, Community Advantage Program works well with minority businesses. We wanna make that a permanent program. Uh, we wanna increase the microloan program. In the microloan program and the Community Advantage Program, we're finding a much better penetration into minority communities. These are all steps that we are taking. Uh, I think next week or the week after, we're gonna have an oversight hearing with uh, Administrator Guzman, the Administrator of SBA, uh, to make sure that we're making contact. One last point I wanna, wanna stress. We're also reaching out to create uh, more support for our resource partners. Thank you for the Chamber for what you do. You're a critical part of providing services uh, to minority communities. We wanna help you in that regard. So I was very happy that we were able at long last to get more women business centers located in the state of Maryland. We have a great center that's headquartered in Rockville that does great work. We now have a, 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 an office, a, a, a women's business center in Salisbury that service our rural communities. We have one now in Baltimore City at Morgan State University. Uh, so these are expansions that we've got and we hope soon we'll be able to announce a veteran center uh, in our community. So these are all steps that are being taken in order to provide additional help uh, so that we can connect the dots and keep small businesses growing. Uh, once we get through this COVID-19, we know our economy will take off. We know small businesses will continue to innovate, but there are challenges. And I'm sure I'm gonna to hear today, it's not easy to find workforce or to maintain workforce. It's not easy to get access to capital for growth. We need to deal with these issues to help small businesses so they can help our economy grow and create the type of jobs for the people in our community. And with that, let me turn it back to you and be glad to get engaged in a conversation. Thank you, Senator Cardin, so much for your words. And uh, before I start our Q&A section, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Senator Susan Lee from Maryland is also on our call this morning. Hi, Senator, how are you? Hello, hello everyone. And thank you, thank you, Senator Ben Cardin for caring so much and also for engaging in this conversation with our top uh, Asian American and uh, Pacific Islander leaders, particularly this group. I'd like to shout out to my wonderful friend, Chi Ling Tong for doing an excellent job and all the leaders. Uh, I, I wanna thank you too, Senator Cardin also for uh, passing the stimulus money that you've uh, gotten out of uh, Congress because let me tell you, it's been vital for the survival of the states, particularly during this pandemic. We just passed in our state uh, the Relief Act of 2021 to provide, uh, to help us roll out, uh, do the vaccine rollout, to get us through, the small businesses get through this pandemic. 
and also to provide vital assistance for all sorts of things. So we encourage you to continue to work on it to bring more money so that the states can uh, be able to survive. But you've been an outstanding champion in doing this. And, and uh, we wanna continue to partner with you, particularly our um, Asian American uh, leaders here because uh, a lot of us are small business owners and we are in very many times the bedrock of our business community. And we have suffered the most, particularly with the COVID-19 and the past administration that has uh, made references to uh, us as Kung flu and, and the China virus, which has created a lot of and provoked a lot of anti-Asian bias and hate crimes. So uh, we, we thank you for helping us pull out of this because we're all in this together and we'll get out of this together. And of course, with your help, and we thank you for the bipartisan support of the legislation that passed that was introduced by Senator Maisie Hirano and uh, Congressman Grace Meng dealing with the anti-Asian bias. We, we are, you are like a lifeline to us because for a long time, we felt like we were all by ourselves. We had no help whatsoever, but you're standing strong with us. So I appreciate that. And I, I want to tell you that we in the uh, Maryland General Assembly are committed to partnering with you to make sure we get that vital funding to our businesses and to our community. And thank you. And Chi-Ling Tong, thank you so much for your outstanding leadership. Dr. Eugenia Henry and all the leaders. I know there's so many on here, but thank you everyone for all working and uniting together because we will get through this together. Thank you so much, Senator Cardin. Well, Senator Lee, first of all, thank you. Um, I really appreciate those kind comments, but I can tell you there is no legislator that's more in tune with her constituency than Senator Lee. She's aggressive in making sure the community voices are heard in the actions of the Maryland State Senate and the General Assembly. So congratulations on a great session. And you're right, it is Team Maryland. We partner, our federal delegation partners very closely with our state legislators and with our county execs. We're in this together. So I was pleased that under the American Rescue Plan, and also, by the way, under the omnibus bills that we passed, we were able to get help to our state and local governments. They needed the help. And the, the Republican leadership blocked us on that in the, in the Congress under President Trump. But under President Biden, we have a, a, a president who understands that we're all in this together, representing all of America. And we're gonna make sure that no one's left behind and everyone gets the help that they need so we were pleased to provide billions of dollars of help to state and local governments. And we're pleased to see those funds are being targeted to the communities that need it to get the vaccines out, to get small business help, to, uh, to open our schools safely, uh, to provide funds for health clinics, uh, to help renters and homeowners so that they, they, they can stay in their homes, create more affordable housing. All that's been done in partnership with our state and local governments. So thank you, Senator Lee, for your leadership. Thank you, Senator. So now um, I can, the beauty of this meeting is that people have submitted some questions. I am gonna call upon a few business owners that had a few questions from um, the Maryland area. Uh, if Jacob is around, Jacob, um, if you can, when I call on you because you had a question, if you can just share a little bit about what you do and then uh, go ahead with your question. Is Jacob Sue around? I am, thank you. <clears throat> so hello, Senator Cardin. It's great to meet you. I'm a fellow Marylander, um, and it's a great opportunity to meet you today. Uh, my name is Jacob Shu, and I'm the CEO of a company called Catalyte. We're a software company headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we discover extraordinary talent from underrepresented communities that we then retrain and upskill to become software engineers. Um, we then put them to work delivering software for businesses and, in the, and for the public sector. Uh, the training is free, and we make the investment and we commit to hiring everyone who completes the program and put them to work. Uh, my question is focused on the topic exactly of workforce retraining and upskilling. Uh, we have proven that we can move people consistently, predictably, and at scale uh, from jobs that are going away into the professional jobs of the future, like engineering and technology and cybersecurity. But the investment is high, right? And that cost has traditionally been borne by individuals who can put themselves through college, right? And that high cost has also been one of the issues exacerbating the opportunity gap and the income gap and the, ultimately the wealth gap in this country. Um, you know, so we're showing today that employers can and should make that investment. What policies and programs will the federal government deploy to encourage, incentivize, and maybe subsidize the cost to employers for retraining and upskilling programs? 
for their own workforces. Well, Jacob, thank you for that question, but more importantly, thank you for what you're doing in the community, particularly in helping train people for the good jobs that are out there. Thank you for reaching out, particularly in the underserved communities. We appreciate that very much. The blueprint is what President Biden calls Build Back Better. It first was the American Rescue Plan to get us through COVID-19, which took a heavy toll on this nation and on our economy and American families. The second part, which is under very active consideration right now, is the American Jobs Plan. That's to build back and modernize our infrastructure. So yes, we have the transportation infrastructure to meet our needs. We have the housing inf infrastructure to meet our needs. We have the educational infrastructure to meet our children's needs. We have the energy infrastructure. We have broadband. All that's critically important in our economy to meet the current needs. And that's why th this bill is particularly important for us to get done. And we're gonna try to get that done within the next several months. And then the third part, we can modernize our infrastructure, but we also have to have the people that are capable and trained to meet these challenges. And the third part is the American Family Plan, the outline of which the president released just a couple of weeks ago. That's now just being considered. That has a heavy component on job training and the deal with how we deal with the cost of higher education. There is no question that we have to deal with the fact that America is an outlier in the cost of higher education, post-secondary education. And we wanna make it affordable for American families. You should be able to send your child to post-secondary education up to a four-year uh, college education without going into debt. Right now, student debt is the second largest amount of debt held by American families, only exceeded by uh, credit card debt. Uh, we need to deal with the realities that, uh, it, it, that we have to make college affordable. Now, there's different ways of doing it. President Biden has brought forward his proposal uh, of a two-year uh, community college uh, or HBCUs being um, uh, tuition-free. Some of our local governments have already instituted those programs. I've introduced legislation that provides four years of debt-free uh, with accountability on behalf of the institution and the students uh, in order to have four years of college education. And we also have enhanced dramatically the job training issues that you've talked about. Uh, under, the, under President Biden's initiative, there would be, uh, I think it's about $100 billion available for job training with partnership with private sector so that the cost of training would be in, underwritten in partnership with the government. We recognize that you're making a great investment to our community by training a workforce, some of whom may work for you, but may, some may go on to other fields. And there's a responsibility collectively to help those costs because a lot of businesses cannot afford the challenge of training or retraining uh, and still be profitable. So we need to be, uh, we need to go in partnership with you. So we have proposals that would do that as well. So it's all part of our strategy. Uh, that we think once in a generation, we have an opportunity to rebuild our nation the way that we need to. We know that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did that after World War II. We think this is another critical moment in America's history where we can really seize the moment. And all those talented people that you've seen in the community that otherwise would not have a chance will have a chance. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I wanted to encourage everyone also, if you have any questions for Senator Cardin, to please use our chat feature. Don't be shy. This is a great time to talk with him. Um, but I also, um, I received a question also from Leo Canseco. Uh, Leo, how are you? Fine. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for the opportunity to um, meet with Senator Cardin and um, allowing me to ask a question. Senator, um, my name is Leo Canseco. I'm a practicing CPA attorney in the state of Maryland. And a lot of my uh, CPA and law practice has to do with helping minority owned businesses obtain uh, 8A certification, like with the United States Small Business Administration, including the state of Maryland. Um, I also help uh, service disabled owned veteran firms become certified as well. Now, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research on the impact of COVID-19 on small businesses, Last year, 26% of Asian-owned businesses closed. If passed, how would the Minority Business Resiliency Act 
and making the Minority Business Development Agency permanent help struggling small businesses? And how would, how would it be uh, a duplication of the work already in the mission of the United States Small Business Administration? I just wanted to um, um, minimize any confusion between the US Small Business Administration and the Minority Business Development Agency, especially when it becomes permanent. Well, well, thank you very much for that question. I really appreciate it. Uh, it gives me a chance to clarify. As I'm sure you're aware, the, the Minority Business Development Agency is located within the Department of Commerce. So it's not within the Small Business Administration. It's another tool available to help minority businesses. And it's been extremely helpful in helping in uh, areas of uh, emerging uh, technologies and markets to make the connections between minority businesses and opportunity. That's what the MBDAs have been best known for. What we want to do is give them greater, first of all, certainty. Right now, it's only established through an executive order. So there is really no uh, authorization from Congress uh, or, or I guess legislative uh, support for, for the mission of the MBDAs. So our legislation would make it permanent. So it is part of legislative mandate. It would also expand its uh, mission to uh, provide additional services to minority businesses uh, within the Department of Commerce that they do not have today. It also would provide additional resources to the Department of Commerce in order to carry out this. It would complement the work of the SBA. The SBA is primarily dealing with access to capital and uh, the set-asides for government contracts to make sure that the agencies carry out their 23% set-aside for small businesses and to try to make sure they do that in a way that doesn't uh, just have small businesses as subcontractors, but as prime contractors. That's all part of the mission and to work with the resource partners, the women's business centers, the veteran centers, uh, the uh, th those areas. That's the, the main purpose of the SBA. So it complements the work of the SBA, brings the Department of Commerce. It's more of an all agency approach to help minority businesses. Thank you. And also I should add, it can help because Commerce has jurisdiction over so many other areas that SBA does not, including tr uh, dealing with some of the trade issues, dealing with some of the uh, regulatory issues. It, it gives another voice to small businesses and dealing with challenges uh, that sometimes can prevent them from being able to have business opportunities. Thank you again, Leo, for your question. Uh, is uh, Amy or Shufan Chen available? I know you had a question, Amy. Okay. Uh, good morning, Senator. I am the owner, Pacific Cafe Amy. Due to my limited English, I have asked Roger to translate for me. Please, Roger. Good morning, Senator. Um, thank you for allowing me to voice my thoughts. And you are our proud Senator and well-respected with my uh, fellow Marylanders. Uh, I am the owner of Pacifica Cafe, a female-owned restaurant, and it's been a Gatorsburg for over 16 years. And we have two couple of issues I'd like to address and ask for help. First of all, oh, by the way, thank you for PPP and uh, uh, restaurant for revitalization funds. That will help us quite a bit. Uh, first problem is a business recovery and the rent recovery speed issue. During this pandemic, business fell over 70%. As for business recover, it takes a long time. The difficulty is the rent. It'll take a long time for business to recover to 100%, but to recover the rent by the landlord only takes time to write a letter and mail it to us. And we just got a mail from landlord that they're demanding full rent. The rent was reduced a little bit. Now they're demanding the full rent. So faced with a high rent, I'm on the verge of bankruptcy. I don't know how to go forward. And the number two issue is landlords discrimination, racial discrimination against tenants. Um, I'm facing with severe, severe the, um, discrimination on racial. I have a letter here that details all the unfair treatment I have received. Where can I send this letter to 
your office so you can review this. I beg the senator to investigate this matter. I don't want a Chinese female business owner to be discriminated against by landlords. This is my last resort for me and my restaurant. You must help me to survive. You're my hope. I trust you can lead us out of this nightmare. Thank you for listening, Senator, and appreciate it. Well, thank you for the question and, and thank you for your just commitment to our community. Uh, we know it's been extremely difficult during COVID-19. Uh, and it was difficult before COVID-19, but COVID-19 made it more difficult. So thank you for your resiliency uh, to, to uh, uh, continue. Uh, let me just make sure that everyone understands what's available today under the special programs for restaurants. Uh, the original CARES Act uh, provided approximately two and a half uh, months of payroll cost. You could use it for more than payroll, but that was the formula that was done for restaurants and other all small businesses that qualified. Under the uh, Extension Act, we increased uh, another uh, two and a half weeks for all small, two and a half months for all small businesses. But for restaurants, we made it three and a half. So we gave an extra month of payroll help. And I say payroll, that's the formula. It can be used for rent. So it, it, these, these monies can be used for payroll. They can be used for rent. So it's equivalent to about five and a half months of your pre-COVID payroll that restaurants have been able to get under the PPP program. In addition to that, Restaurants were eligible, uh, eligible for low interest idle loans, uh, the, the 30 year loans at uh, low interest rates uh, was, was another area where they could get some additional help. Uh, and then, as you pointed out, we just uh, started the Restaurant Relief Act. Uh, this program is now available, the window is open. So I hope that you've applied for it. Uh, you are, if you're able to get in this program, which you should be able to, uh, based upon what you said your revenue losses have been, uh, you will be entitled uh, to make up for your revenue losses as a result of COVID-19. Uh, obviously, uh, your PPP funds come off of that, but that can make up for your revenue losses, which could then be used to pay the rent that you're referring to. So these are all tools that are currently available. I wanna make sure you take advantage that are specific by the federal government to restaurants. In addition to that, we have provided substantial funds as Senator Lee pointed out to state and local governments, including our county and municipal governments. Those funds can be used to help small businesses in circumstances such as yours and have been used by, by, local, by uh, uh, state and local governments to assist uh, small business owners who are stressed the way that you have pointed out. Just point that out because there may be other tools available at the state and local level in addition to what's available at the federal level. As it relates to your concerns on discrimination, uh, it sounds like what you're talking about could very well violate our, our, uh, our uh, property laws in this country. And if that's the case, the, the, the two agencies are, that are the most effective to try to help you at the federal level is the Department of Justice, and we will certainly put you in contact with the, the Federal Department of Justice. At the state level, it's the Attorney General's Office who works on these issues. And Senator Lee or any of us can get you in touch with the Attorney General's Office who can investigate these issues. But they would be the appropriate offices to investigate discrimination issues. Thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate, appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I know we had a question come in on our chat from Karina Shen. Karina, would you like to ask your question? I can, or would you like to speak to Senator Cardin? I can, or I can ask the question for you. Okay, well, I can ask the question for Karina. Uh, how is the Senate going to help with racism beyond the pandemic? Are you going to address the stigmas around minority communities such as, um, see, such as the myth of MSG in Chinese restaurants was her question. So thanks for the question. Uh, America has been on a, a journey 
uh, to provide opportunity for all of our people without discrimination so that everyone can participate in this great country. Uh, we've been on this road uh, now since our inception. We, are not a, we were not a perfect nation when we started. We're not a perfect nation today. We still have significant challenges that we have to overcome. But I must tell you, if I were to pick any country in the world that I won't want to raise my family, it would be the United States of America. So I think this country offers the greatest opportunity, but we have problems. We have systemic racism in America. These challenges came to light for the whole world to see in policing. Uh, and we were on display to the entire world uh, and saw that just hor horrific conduct. Uh, and George Floyd was just one example of many. Uh, we have seen the impact of systemic racism uh, during COVID-19 and the, uh, uh, the communities that were most vulnerable to the disease and death. We've seen systemic racism in our schools. We've seen it in our housing. Uh, we've seen it uh, in economic opportunity and pay. Uh, so we, we've seen the, the systemic problems uh, in, in so many different areas. I really do believe that the leadership in the White House White is critically House. important. I make no bones about it. And this is not a partisan issue. It's a, the person who was the former president, Donald Trump, uh, divided America, did not bring us together. We now have a president that really wants to bring us together, who wants to deal with these problems. And we'll talk about them openly and we'll find ways to make progress. That's why my top priority as chair of the Small Business Committee is to make sure that those tools that help entrepreneurship that can reduce the wealth gap in America is available to all with special attention to the underserved communities. So as we reach out and try to deal with these problems, we do think we can make significant progress in building back better and fairer America under leadership of President Biden. It sounds like Karina wanted to say a few words. Karina? Oh, there she is. I think you would have to unmute. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Senator Carton. And I, I always wish that a government can have more concrete policy or help to us uh, Asian community. And I know everybody is aware of what's happening now. But I just, you know, just being a proud Marylander, being a proud U.S. citizen since 1975, I love our country and I hope um, there's a lot we can do more uh, to help out all uh, Asian, all, all race. And um, um, if there's anything we can help more, uh, we will always love to. And I am a real believer of unity will always make us stronger. And again, thank you, Senator. Uh, you've been a great leader to us and that's work together. Thank you. Your, your message of unity is so, so important. You know, I've had the great honor of representing the people of Maryland in the Senate. And I meet with communities that have been under attack uh, currently, it is the Asian American uh, community that is under attack. You know, there's no question about it. Uh, and it's been the irresponsible leadership uh, in the language that they've used to describe the coronavirus. Uh, but I've been with the Muslim community after 9-11 and saw how they were under attack. I've been with the African American community uh, after the uh, Freddie Gray episode in Baltimore City and uh, to to deal with, with, with those issues. Uh, so I, I've, been, I've been to the LGBTQ community and, and have seen the, the violence that have been expressed against them. I've been to the, the immigrant community, they're new uh, to deal with uh, those that uh, have recently arrived in this country, the dreamers, the te those on temporary protective status. Uh, and, and I've seen the violence and hatred that has been expressed against uh, immigrants, again, by the reckless comments of some of our leaders and the misinformation of, of Americans. And the issue of unity is so important if we stand together and say that if any community is not safe, none of us are safe. 
And we need to be to united in that effort to say that we will not tolerate any irresponsible activities or language used against any community in this country. And we'll stand united in those efforts. If we do that, we'll come through this as a much stronger country. And I think that's what we're seeing today uh, come out of the leadership of President Biden. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. I, I wanted to call on Matthew Lee. Matthew, we have to commend you on your background as well, because it's it's awesome. We love that you're in a picture with Senator Cardin, but wanted to give you an opportunity <laughs> to also ask your question. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Chilling Tong, and for coordinating this great event. And thank you so much for Senator Cardin. I mean, I'm from Baltimore. We went to, I went to your rival high school, so. <laughs> But uh, also thanks to the Senator Susan Lee, she's a you know champion of our AAPI community. So, so just quickly, I know everybody you know uh, yeah, has a lot of questions, but you know uh, for you know our AAPI community have a more of a voice. Uh, I think we need to have a leadership uh, uh, appointed position by Biden campaign uh, Biden administration. So especially SBA, you know I know we have a that uh, you know, administrator already appointed it. So there is a deputy or assistant administrator position for AAPI community. Is that something you can help us to get the, you know, those leadership appointed position? Well, Matthew, first of all, thank you. And th thank you for pointing out that I am a proud product of the Baltimore City Public School System. Uh, received an excellent education, gave me the opportunities of this great nation. Uh, and had the privilege of graduating from City. I'm sorry you couldn't get into City, but Polly isn't that bad, so it's okay. Uh, uh, so, and that's one of the reasons why I really am a strong supporter of the Kerwin Commission's recommendations in Maryland. Uh, as a federal official, I've introduced legislation that would supplement and help fund the Kerwin Commission uh, implementation in a state that's bold enough to move forward uh, with, with that type of commitment for public education. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and Matthew, thank you for sh showing me. Um, I see double vision right now. Look at who what President Biden has done in his first 100 days. You see a cabinet that looks like America. It's not just the principal positions. All the way down the line, uh, we, we're seeing a commitment to diversity. And yes, uh, we are finding representatives. That's why the uh, bill that we passed that Senator Lee referred to by Senator Rono uh, provides for that type of an appointment within the Department of Justice so that we have sensitivity uh, that recognizes what we need to do at this time uh, to deal with the challenges in the uh, Asian Pacific American community. So with all that in mind, Absolutely, uh, we want to make sure that there are key representatives of the community at, every, at the table as all of these decisions are being made and as policy is being developed. Thank, Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew, for your question. Um, we had another question come in from one of our board members. His name is Jimmy Ferguson. Jimmy, are you available to ask your question? I'm good. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jimmy Ferguson. I'm a, I'm a business owner from Austin, Texas, but uh, if I was living in Maryland and uh, you know, I would support you 100% and I still do. I'm also the policy committee chair for the National AIDS. And on behalf of uh, 2.3 million AAPI small business, you know, we want to thank you for your leadership and for your support. Uh, for the small businesses around the country. You know, you understand and you get it at what we are going through. I have two questions, Senator. One, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research on the impact of the COVID-19 on small business, from the February to April of last year, 26% of our Asian owned business closed. And, and today, you know, we have well over 50% that's still struggling. If passed, how would the Minority Business Resistance Act would make the MBD, MBDA a permanent, which we all support, uh, uh, how would they uh, impact the struggling the small business that we have today? Mm -hmm. 
And, and, the, and the second question is, last week, the SBA announced that funding for the PPP is almost gone. And many minority-owned businesses have yet to receive the PPP funding, or if they did, uh, it's been depleted, you know, within 90 days, 120 days. Um, and, and we know there's been um, two fundings. If the COVID-19 situation continues, especially with the emergence of the new uh, contagious vir uh, variant, uh, would it be possible for the third round of PPP? So thank you, Senator. Thank you for all those questions. Let me, let me just uh, point out the PPP program, which was passed initially in the CARES Act uh, last March, a year ago, March, and then the second round of PPP that was provided in the December omnibus bill had a termination date of March 31st of this year. We expand, extended that through legislation that I co-authored uh, to the end of May. So the program is open till the end of this month. But as you point out, there may not be enough money in the program to last through the month of May. And we do not think there will be enough money in there to last through the end of May. So we do think we're gonna come up a bit short, but I just wanna point out, people have had opportunities. So we've, been, we've put them yeah. on notice to get their applications in. We've tried to do as much outreach as possible. Uh, I participated in numerous events, particularly in minority communities, uh, and we made special efforts by walling off certain amount of money that must go to underserved communities. So we think we've protected the hard to serve communities in this effort. Uh, we've recently changed some of the guidelines for nonprofits. We changed some of the guidelines for the self-employed to make it more beneficial for them to be able to apply for for benefits. So we know there are some groups that have had some challenges getting their applications in, and we certainly will look at whether we need to put more money in in order to meet those that are eligible but have not yet received the funds under the two rounds of PPP with the extended eligibility. The question you asked about a third round of PPP, uh, we're open for business. We'll see how things are going. Uh, we know that we just uh, put into, uh, into the economy a substantial amount of relief under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we also know that we can see a light at the end of the tunnel, that the restrictions uh, under health guidelines are being uh, relaxed. And we hope that we, by uh, this summer, can see a much more normal return of our economy. So we're monitoring it. But if, it's, if the COVID-19 continues to persist, if we get additional unpredictable uh, variants that cause uh, us to change our decisions, then we have to be prepared to take up additional help uh, for uh, American families and businesses that need help. So it won't just be PPP, but there'll be other aspects of it that we have to take a look at. We have to take a look at unemployment yeah. insurance that expires in September. Uh, we have to take a look at homeowners and renters assistance. We have to take a look at the COVID distribution system itself. There'll, there'll be other issues that we're going to have to take a look at. Uh, but right now, we believe we have taken care of the issues, at least until the fall. We'll see how things go as we get into the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. And thank you, Senator Cardin. I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to, to help close out. I know we are being mindful of your time and we so thank you so much for, for everything you've done for us today. Well, this has been a great conversation. I, just to supplement that last question, we, we may need money in the PPP program to get through the current eligibility list. If that's necessary, we will. I will certainly support that. Uh, we need bipartisan support in order to get it done promptly. And we are looking at whether that's possible or not. There's actually a bill that I have filed that would uh, correct an inequity in the PPP program dealing with the self-employed uh, that the calculation was only perspective. We think it should be retroactive. So there are some changes we would like to make from people who may have been left out and that may require some additional funds being put into the PPP program. So stay tuned on that. Uh, and I, I, in the, I didn't answer that part dealing with the minority business uh, development agencies. I think I did that once before. 
the MBDAs can connect the, can connect the dots. Let me, the, the one area that you mentioned about a struggling business, that's the reason why I introduced the Uplift, which works under the SBA, which would provide incubator and accelerators to struggling small minority businesses. So we do have programs in there to try to connect the dots for companies that need some uh, special attention. Uh, and we do this with minority institutions. So therefore the, the partnership was with those in the community that know of the community and can help identify the small businesses that need this attention. And in many cases, we do it on the campuses of these minority institutions. So it is, it's the right type of a partnership to develop not just the business, but also to develop the sensitivity within the community and the workforce necessary uh, for job growth in the community. So uh, let me just sort of bring this together by saying this has been very, very helpful. This is a, a continuing conversation so please reach out to us. Uh, we, we, we expect that uh, specific issues, whether it's discriminatory uh, issues being referred to agencies or help in navigating the SBA programs, we can put you in touch with the people who can help. We can try to answer your questions, but we really do want your input. Uh, to me, that was critically important in developing uh, our response to COVID-19. Uh, this has been an unprecedented uh, pandemic, and yet I think our future looks bright because we really did work together to try to provide the relief necessary for small businesses. And I hope that we can continue that partnership. We certainly will have my outreach as chairman of the committee uh, to always seek your advice. It's an honor to represent those of you who live in Maryland and for my friends around the rest of the nation. Uh, thank you very much um, for everything you do and to National ACE, uh, you guys do a fabulous work on behalf of the Asian Pacific American community. Uh, keep up your great work. Thank you all very much. Senator, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, as a, a, in order to celebrate AAPI Heritage Month, we would like to have a photo with you. And uh, may I have everybody turn on your camera? And uh, uh, Emily, can you take a great photo with Senator? Yep. Okay, we're gonna take it in three, two, one. There Senator, you. thank you so much for you know updates regarding American uh, family plan, uh, American jobs plan. As a chair of a small business entrepreneurship committee, you have been the uh, uh, forefront of a rebuilding our economy. As uh, Jimmy Ferguson has mentioned, we represent or 2.2 million AAPI business. We'll definitely pass this message, you know, through newsletter to all our uh, uh, members, and also 60 affiliate AAPI chamber throughout the country. And also, we want to thank uh, all the small business owner. Thank you for sharing with us about your business, how you're holding together during this challenging time. Pacific Cafe, oh, it's a sad story. And please go shopping, you know, please go to eat over there. They are in Gettysburg and uh, we are just love to see you over there. Unity, Senator, thank you so much for bringing this together. You know, this, this definitely, this discussion means a lot to us. AAPI community is a fast growing group and we are not perpetual foreigner. We are American and we are here to stay. I think we want to just want to help the country to live up to uh, its promise. The beauty of America is giving anybody a chance. Asian American are just much as American as everyone who lives in this country. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, we really are pleased we'll be able uh, to, uh, to be here with you. And uh, now uh, Maryland Senator Susan Lee, would you like to say a few words and close this event? Okay, first of all, uh, Chief Ying Tong, thank you for your extremely outstanding leadership and also for getting this all together and everyone who made this possible. And Senator Cardin, thank you for being a champion of our uh, fast growing AAPI community. It means a lot to us as, as uh, Chi Ling Tong says, you know, we uh, uh, Asian Americans, all different generations built this country, we built America and the new immigrants that are here today are building on that foundation. And we are Americans, uh, we're not foreigners and uh, we wanna continue to have this engagement with you so we're really grateful because this is the way that we can tell you uh, and highlight our important issues so that we can partner together. 
So uh, it meant a lot to us. And thank you to, so much, too, for passing that hate crimes law in the United States Senate. I'm, I'm sure it'll probably sail through the House, hopefully, uh, because, um, you know, hate knows no borders at all. So it's important that we have a, a federal law in addition, because we have state laws, we have state laws in Maryland. But I said, as I said before, hate knows no borders. So let's continue to work together. And, and Asian American leaders, thank you so much for expressing and bringing to the forefront uh, some of your important issues to our wonderful Senator Cardin, because we have to continue to engage in this substantive dialogue through forms like this. And again, Senator Cardin, you're the best. Thank you for your leadership, your work, and championing our community. And everyone, Take care and stay safe and well. Senator, thank you again for you and your staff. Uh, Jerome has been so helpful and thank all, everybody to participate in this event. Uh, we will continue to celebrate uh, uh, Asian Heritage Month. Thank you, see you at next event. Stay well, everybody. Thanks. Thank